Hi, my name is James. This video is about micro occlusion. Micro occlusion fits into most occlusal schemes, whether I'm doing an implant, whether it's in a worn dentition, or whether it's in a dentition that's not really aged yet, but it all works. These are the principles I've learned from a number of mentors through the years, like Jimmy Eubanks, Bob Lee, and Bob Jinkelson. So micro occlusion, let's go for it. Also, I want to announce that I'm up here in my digital studio at my homestead. We're almost done. We have the floors completed, the ceilings are completed, the walls are completed, and then we have the cabinets and the equipment to get in here. But this is where I'm gonna be creating most of my content creation and I'm really looking forward to it. So micro occlusion, how do we set that up? in our clinical theater. There's several things to remember. Number one, I wanna take a compression PDL bite. I'll place that link below. I'm really big on the PDL compression bite and I started doing that back with BlueCam and it works well with all digital systems, mainly because we have to understand how the compression of PDLs can happen. And I'll post that link below. Now, once we have our bite registration, we wanna set a few parameters. And this is what the dense supply is on the system. Number one, occlusal contact strength. I want that at negative 50. That's gonna be aqua. Now, occlusal offset, if you're using the M6L with the current version of the software, I set that at negative 150. You can set occlusal offset in the prime mill. It's under settings, it's in a different location. But I have found that factory default of zero has worked very well. Once we start our digital workflow and we've taken that compressed bite, the workflow I use is setting the tooth up to the arch, and that usually happens in the software today. The second step is setting up our occlusion, and then the third step is adjusting the proximal contacts and emergence, and then we mill. So let's spend some time on that second step, because that's what defines microocclusion. The concept of microocclusion is going to be the following. I want my contacts to be on non-inclined slopes, which would be working cusp, landing pad for a molar, and a marginal ridge, or two marginal ridges, number one. Number two is I want it to be one millimeter square, and I learned that from Jimmy Eubanks years ago, and I've been using this principle for a long time. Another concept we have to be aware of is occlusal reduction, so we can get ideal morphology for the case, because if we don't have enough reduction, then we have a compromised occlusion, and that's when we start to get interference. My dogs are down here playing. Hey guys, settle down, <laughs> settle down. Um, so that's what you hear in the background there. So by getting enough occlusal reduction, my criteria for that is minimal thickness. We're gonna reverse engineer. So minimal thickness of the material you're using times two. So usually that's gonna be around one for most of our products today like Emacs, unless we're in zirconia, like the 4Y that's 0.8 and the 3Y is 0.6. Then we can reverse engineer our prep knowing that our morphology is gonna fit the case with the AI software, and it does. When we're setting up our occlusion on a molar like this, this is a type of don, but it illustrates really well what we're trying to accomplish. We're gonna pull up the occlusion where we want it on the primary cusp, landing pad, and marginal ridge. Then we're gonna use our contact adjusting feature in the software. For occlusion, that parameter is a negative 50 occlusal contact strength. So when we click on that tool, it will create an aqua everywhere on that occlusal table. So we've just virtually adjusted our occlusion. But here's the caveat, we're not done yet. When we look at this occlusion, you can see there's contacts over the dome of those working cusps. That's gonna create micro working and balancing interferences and protrusive and retrusive. So when we're looking at this case, to create these contacts on non-inclined slopes, we're gonna use the removal tool at 10%. Removal tool at 10%, it doesn't gouge that virtual surface and it will leave your morphology. I prefer that over smooth. So our first step is to remove those working interferences on the buccal cusp. Then when we look at the landing pad, you can see that's on a slope. So that could turn into a balancing interference. So we're gonna take that removal tool right above that landing pad in the central fossa and just bring down that triangular ridge so we have a flat spot for the landing pad. 
and on the buccal cusp lingual triangular ridges, we want to move those contacts to the top of the ridge. Those would be balancing interferences. Our next step is the marginal ridge. We want that to be at the conical height of that marginal ridge. When it's at the height of that conical ridge, it will deflect forces, which means there's less force vibration going down the long axis of your restoration, which would be either into a root or an implant. This is how you still create efficiency but you control force dynamics. And that's really important to understand that by creating contacts that are one millimeter square. Is this all starting to make sense now? So my next step is to make sure they're all aqua. Now when I'm doing Emacs, I want the stronger aqua on those points. When I'm doing zirconia, I want the lightest, more diffused aqua. And I find that within the prime mill system that is pretty much spot on and I don't have to do a lot of clusal adjusting if any at all. What does this do for us once we see the restoration? Well first of all we don't have to adjust it once we fit it in the mouth and second of all you'll see less post-treatment sensitivity. All teeth settle in time due to PDL movement and we've already spoken about that and the dynamics of chewing and swallowing and the forces on a new crown, there's slightly different subtle forces. And the crown may settle a bit into that posing dentition until it reaches an equilibrium with the compression of the PDLs. <laughs> so once we have these points set up, it acts as a GPS system for occlusal settling. So even two or three or four months out, we shouldn't be seeing working in lateral and protrusive and retrusive interferences showing up in our clusal scheme because of our design concept. This is a principle I've been applying for years and it's been huge for me in my clinical theater on not having to do a lot of post-treatment follow-up adjustments. Whether I'm doing a single tooth, a quadrant, or full mouth rehab, these are the principles I use with micro-occlusion. I hope this video has helped you today this is my journey over the last half of my career and it's made a huge difference on not seeing a lot of post-treatment adjustment needs. Usually those are hot and cold that show up a week or a month later because the tooth has shifted. And once we have these principles down in our design sequence, we won't be adjusting them chair side and losing that beautiful morphology which we know is an emotional hit for us all. So if you have any comments or questions, please post those below. I'd love to hear what you have to say, and I'll speak to you in that next video.